God, our Savior, as we hear your word, send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher of faith and truth and show us how we are called to live through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'll be reading scripture from the Old Testament, Amos 8, chapter 8, 4 through 7. And if you're following along, it will be on page 911. Hear this, you who trample the needy, and do away with the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath be ended, that we may market wheat, skipping the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales? buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, I will never forget anything they have done. I'll be reading the New Testament scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 7. I urge then... First of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, and the testimony given in its proper time. And for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. The next reading is going to be coming from the Gospel Scripture reading of Luke 16. 1 through 13. The parable of the shrewd manager. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I know, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors, and he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of oil, olive oil, he replied. And the manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. And he told him, Take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world, world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into internal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money.
So I picked the sermon title, Faith and Prayer. Did something a little bit different. We'll see how this goes. Paul has written a letter to Timothy, who was left behind Ephesus, to instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrines or teachings and not to occupy themselves with false beliefs and endless geologies that promote notions that don't have firm evidence. But rather than divine training that is known by faith, the aim of such training is love that comes from a pure heart and a good conscience. There is only one true God. The object of faith is God and his promises that were made. One example would be Abram's encounter with God. Genesis 15, verse 5. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars. If you are able to count them, then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. At this time, Abram is about 100 years old. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness, truth. Abraham didn't leave doubt or had no distrust concerning the promise of God. Paul writes that Abraham grew strong in his faith and as he gave glory to God. And Abraham didn't weaken in faith, but was convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And Abraham didn't turn to sin, but remained faithful to God. Then as things go on, then Paul talks about his conversion from being sinful toward his toward the disciples of the Lord and others. Paul had persecuted men and women, and he had them put in prison. Acts chapter 8, verse 3. But Saul was ravaging the church by entering the house after house, dragging off both men and women, and he committed them to prison. He was not a nice person, better put, a wicked man. Saul had authority from the chief priest to put all who work put all who work in the Lord's name in prison. And Annas has identified Saul as persecutor, and the Lord prompts the new identification. As we know, at Paul's conversion he had became blind. So he, God punished him for about three years maybe more days, while well, he sent Annas to touch him so he could see. And of course, Annas had said something, but the whole thing is, is Paul was able to see. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go for, he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. Paul had received mercy from the Lord, for he acted ignorantly in, on, in unbelief. Verse 13. And the Lord overflowed Paul with faith and love, and that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, in which Paul was foremost. He was a sinner himself, but he came through his conversion. He had faith and love. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who was, has strengthened me because he had judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Upon Paul's conversion, he had faith and did God's will, and he was thankful to do good. Paul had received salvation with a full way of a divine mercy, and Paul had viewed himself as a chief sinner. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, to Timothy, my loyal child, in the faith. Paul was addressing false teachers, and just much like today, we can easily be led astray by false promises or empty promises. And you and I need to be ready and fight the good fight like Paul is telling Timothy. Prayer is important also. Prayer is for everyone and not just for the few. Prayer is communicating with God. And you and I need to listen and talk to him. And God tells us in good time what we need to know. We need to be persistent and pray every day. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. 
Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all saints. Supplication is a petition or request to God and is used for personal needs, the need of others, or requests regarding the will of God. An example of a prayer would be, I pray that you will cleanse me, strengthen me, guide me, so that in all my ways my life may be lived as you would have lived it without calderness and for you alone. Show me how to live in true humility, true supplication, true contrition, and true love. There are four parts which one was just mentioned. Supplication was one, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, first of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made to everyone. And Paul is giving instructions concerning prayer, and that prayer is for everyone. Next are prayers that may humble, that make humble, and serious requests for what is beneficial and offered to God, everyday prayers. Next you have intercession is someone who intercedes, mediates, advocates, or pleads in behalf of others for each other as needs are perceived. And in tertiary prayers, last would be thanksgiving prayer, which is the deep expression of our gratitude to God for his grace. Example of a thanksgiving prayer would be, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeem of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from lands, from the east, from the west, from the north and from the south. Paul was describing the worship community at prayer. And the words prayer for all and ransom for all, the church prayer is lifted for all. It is not only for kings or the rich, but for everyone. The son's sacrifice was offered for all too. And prayer is urged for all, not just ourselves, the community, but it's for the whole world. And there is hope yet. There is one true God. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? There is one mediator between God and humankind for the whole humanity, and which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave ransom for us all. And Jesus Christ died for us all. And the cross was for all. Paul was appointed apostle to proclaim the truth to all, verse 7. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Even when a ruler is unjust, the church prays to God. They pray for bad men to be good, and even in the decades of persecution, the church did not fail to request for the persecutors to change their ways. You and I can grasp the concept of praying selectively for some. There is temptation all around us, but we are still human. Example would be when Jeremiah had urged the people that were exiled in Babylon to pray to the Lord on its behalf. Upon the praying for their captors, they would find their welfare. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7, But such the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. The church does have a stake in civil peace. If civil authority isn't preserved, and the law-abiding Christians would become fugitives too. Why does the church pray for civil peace with justice? So, the church can or be able to lead a life of tranquility and have peace. The church prayed for the magistrates and policy makers to make good judgments, to restrain violence, encourage peace, provide political order in which truth, goodness, and religion were possible, and to respect the law. 
You and I can pray at any time, but be persistent, for God answers us when he is ready and not when we want it. I'm going to leave you with two questions for us to think about. One, what is truth faith to you? And second, why do Christians need prayer? Need to pray? Both of these questions came from the book of Confessions and from the Heidelberg Catechism. Truth faith is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold as a true all that God has revealed to us in Scripture. It is also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit creates in me by the gospel that God has freely granted not only to others but to me also forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness, and salvation. These gifts are of sheer grace granted solely by Christ's merit. Next question was because prayer is the most important part of the thankfulness God requires of us, and also because God give his grace and Holy Spirit only to those who pray continually and grow inwardly, asking God for these gifts and thanking God for them. We have talked not just about ourselves, but the church and the importance of faith and prayer in our daily lives. And you and I know faith isn't easy that faith grows over time. Everyone's faith can be in a different growth and can be tested at times. And prayer needs to be persistent and don't let up until you and I get an answer from God. There is still hope, even when the darkness all around us, you and I need to remain steadfast in love and faith in God. Amen. Thank you for letting us share our worship service with you today. We invite you to join us in person next Sunday at 1030, or if you prefer, to listen online Sunday afternoon. If you would like to make a donation, please visit our website at www.marionpress.org and click the Donate Now button. May God bless you and have a great week.